Good morning, Digital Cathedral family. It's hard to believe, but we are into the month of October. So we've got October, November, December. We're down to the last quarter of the year. This morning, we're going to start our a process. It's going to take me several weeks to get through. I don't know how long, but I'm going to, uh, it'll be a different title on the teaching each week, but it's going to kind of be centered around the theme of what I think is Paul's absolute heavy revy. That's the title this morning, Heavy Revy. And then in the weeks that are ensuing for a while, we're going to explore what this Heavy Revy is. If I were to, to look at Paul and everything that Paul taught, I would, I would narrow it down to one thing that I think was the very center and the very core of Paul's teaching. I would call it the revelation of revelations. And that was the truth that Paul brought to the table that had never been explored which, up to that point, which is Christ in us. Christ in us is the springboard that I think Paul used to move off into all the revelation that he shared about uh, our identity, our authentic identity, finished work of the cross, uh, maturing and manifesting as sons and daughters of God. They all came out of this, this revelation that Paul had of the Christ that is in us. I want to I want to just if I can for a minute track this through the progression that Paul began to reveal the Christ that is in us. It started with his own life. It started with the revelation that Christ was in him. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 and 16 We've read this before at the Digital Cathedral, but I'm just using this for, for emphasis this morning. I'm going to share about four scriptures, just bang, bang, bang. And I want you to see how Paul took this message of Christ in us and began to expand it to all people. He says this, he starts with himself, verse 15. He said, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, the Christ in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul knew that his assignment was the Gentiles, but what I want to point out there is that the Christ or Jesus was revealed in him. Now we can use the Jesus in Christ, I think inter interchanged, uh, but Paul's saying that Jesus, that Christ was not revealed to him, was revealed actually in him. Now this is a startling fact. I think what Paul is saying is even when he was wreaking havoc on the early Christian church, killing Christians, imprisoning Christians, that the Christ was in him, but he did not know it. He did not recognize it. He was seeing through the veil of the old covenant, through Jewish traditions, which Paul was highly trained and educated and an expert in the Jewish, the Jewish religion. So Paul starts with himself. And then in Colossians chapter 1, if you have your Bible this morning, always have your Bible when you come to the Digital Cathedral because we, we use our Bible here. And I do it the old-fashioned way. I like to turn over in, in my Bible and actually read it. He says, This mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations, <coughs> excuse me, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Gentiles, Christ in you. That was the mystery. Paul said it's now being revealed. So what, what does Paul do? <coughs> Goodness, got a tickle in my throat here. Let me get a quick drink. Paul was saying this, this mystery or this Christ in us was first revealed in myself. I didn't know it was there, always had been there. I want to please the Father. He revealed it to me. Then Paul says, it's revealed in me. Now I'm going to move this out and, and show the Gentiles that the Christ has always been in them too, that Christ is in them as well. Now in Colossians chapter 3, he just keeps moving it out further. And this probably drove, this drives church nuts today. I've, I've never heard this verse taught in any any church at any time that is evangelical, charismatic, Pentecostal. So Paul starts with himself, Christ in me, moves it to the Gentiles, the mystery Christ in you Gentiles. And then he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, he says, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. 
That's just an irrefutable fact. Now, what I want you to see in this is that he includes the barbarian and the Scythian. The Scythian is an interesting people group. I, I might have mentioned before, <coughs> but the Scythians were the most barbaric, unevangelized people that lived along the Black Sea. The gospel had never gotten to the Scythians. And I think it's noteworthy that Paul says that even the Scythians, did, did you, did you see, see how he ended that verse? But Christ is all and in all. So he even includes the most barbaric group of people never been evangelized. So we're going to spend some time over the next few weeks exploring because this Christ in you is like a multifaceted diamond. The more I explore it, the more I, I uh, research, the more I meditate, the more I look at it, I see, I see so many parts to this that I don't think we've really explored. I don't think we've really integrated into our life. We haven't really come to a full realization and acceptance that every person we look at, Christ is in them. Just, just for a, a verse of confirmation, Paul over in Acts chapter 17 is, is speaking to idol worshipers. I mean, these people had flat out no Christian background, knew nothing about Jesus. In that 17th chapter, and I'm not going to take time to read it because we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning. But Paul's exploring through and he's, he comes into the, into the city and he sees that the idol worship is so prevalent. And so he gets into the, into the center of the city where the philosophers uh, share their philosophies and they invited Paul in. They heard about this strange thing he's talking about. And so in that 28th verse of the 17th chapter and speaking to idol worshipers, after he's already said that we are all children of God, <clears throat> in that 28th verse of the 17th chapter, he says, in speaking to the idol worshipers, he said that it's in him that we live and we move and we have our being. I just let that settle in a little bit. He's not speaking to, to anybody that had ever heard the gospel. He's coming to them. And what he's doing is he's coming from a, he's coming from a position in a place of good news. He's not telling them that, you know, they better accept this or they're going to burn forever. He's not coming with any bad news. He's coming with good news of, I'm telling you, the God that you, you serve, you don't know his name, but actually, actually, it's the God that I've come to present to you. Maybe there's something in there for other religions that we think are so off track that maybe, maybe they're actually serving the God. They don't know what to call him. They've misnamed him, perhaps. And that's what Paul was getting at. But he said, the God that I'm bringing to you really is the one that you're serving because we all live and move and have our being in the God that I'm presenting to you. Now, some know it, Paul said, and some don't know it. And I'm here to enlighten you. I think one of the greatest desires I have is to get some serious revelation, some serious understanding on how to live out of the total sufficiency of the Christ that is within me. I think we, we've probably looked at it <clears throat> in some different ways. Uh, feeding on the tree of life, I think, is another way of saying learning to live out of the Christ that is within me. Uh, Jesus certainly lived, Jesus fed on the tree of life continually. He didn't, the secret to the life of Jesus is that he never ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He, he never did. Jesus lacked nothing as he focused on the tree of life and the voice of the Father. Jesus did not eat. He did not focus on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Instead, he never made a move, never made a decision without hearing what the Father was saying to him. That's a big lesson in there. I, I've, I'm trying to learn it <clears throat> to not move until I know what he is saying. <clears throat> Jesus heard the voice of the Father and he simply responded. That's the tree of life. I do have revelation on at least that depth of it. That the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is when I decide what's good, what's evil, what's right, what's wrong. And you can hit it, you can miss it. But the tree of life, tree of life is a tree of simply responding to what the Father says to you. So Jesus never lived with two opinions. Jesus never lived with two options. Jesus never lived a life where there were multiple directions that he could take. He only had one direction. And this is what made, made him so focused and honed in on, on 
the mission the Father sent him on, tremendous, tremendous lesson in that for us. The same spirit that was in Jesus that directed him, the same Christ, the same tree of life, same kingdom, same garden. We can phrase it several different ways, but it's a source. It's the totality of one source. The same spirit that was in Jesus is in you. I'm sure you remember what Paul said, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. It'll give the God kind of life to your flesh man. That, that leads into a whole, whole area of revelation and truth that maybe we're just starting to come into. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus started his ministry, along about that 17th, 18th verse, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. The Christ in you anoints you. The Christ in Jesus anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, six, seven things mentioned in Luke chapter four that the anointing empowered Jesus to do. And then we come over to 1 John chapter 20, or 1 John chapter two and verse 20 and 27, and it, both, both of those verses say that you have an anointing. I think it's the 20th verse that says you have an anointing, watch this, and you know all things. Now, we kind of recoil at that and say, there are a lot of things I don't know. Well, the anointing says that you do know it. The anointing gives you access. The Christ that is within you, the anointing, the Christ, the kingdom, the garden, however we want to phrase it, but I'm, I'm sticking with the Christ in you because I think that's, that's the fundamental uh, source from which Jesus operated from and the source that we can operate from that gives us, never gives us lack as we eat from the tree of life. The, the Christ within you only eats from the tree of life. When you move over and you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I'll just tell you, friend, you're on your own. You dig a hole and then you're praying and begging and pleading God to come help you get out of the hole when you should have never been in the hole to begin with. So the Christ in you is a revelation that the garden, the kingdom, the tree of life, the Christ is you has everything that you need. Now I want to back up and run that at you again. The Christ that is within you gives you access to everything you need. Everything you need you already possess because of the Christ that is within you. You never find, think about this, did you, I, and I've searched the gospel, I studied this out thoroughly. I never found one time where, where Jesus had to pray or use his faith, you know, get his faith out there to receive anything for himself. He never did, he prayed for other people. I think he moved in faith for other people, but Jesus for himself never had, never had to pray for healing, Never had to pray for money, never had to pray for clothes, never had to pray to come out of depression or, or to try to gain emotional stability or deliverance from the devil. He never prayed for any of those things. Jesus never asked the guys to gather around and say, guys, I, I don't feel, feel well today. Would y'all lay hands on me and, and just, just pray over me? Never did that. Why didn't he do that? Because he knew how to draw from the Christ that was within him. Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ. See, the word Christ simply means anointed one. In, in a real way, you are not Jesus the Christ, but in a real way, you are a Christ because you carry an anointing. John, John chapter 2, verse 20, 27 makes that explicitly clear. The Father makes it clear in, in Paul's writings, if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, which is the Christ spirit, dwells in you, it also quicken your mortal bodies. So we're learning now in this, in this Christ as us life, this learning to live the Christ life. We're learning that one of the keys to it is having the mind of Christ. Paul said in, uh, in, in your book, in Philipp what is it, Philippians 2.5, he said, let this mind be in you. Let this mind, give it right away. Give it precedence to the mind which is in Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Then I, I really like how Paul said it in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. So by having the mind of Christ then, he instructs us. It's that, it's that Christ connection that we have that allows him. We, who, 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 has, who has known the mind of the Lord that we may instruct him? We don't instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We have his mind so that he's able to impart and give to us exactly what he has. There's, there's no, here's what I'm trying to get at. It, and this, I think, is one of the keys of learning to live the, the Christ-centered life, the Christocentric life. Learning to live out of the Christ that is within, as Jesus did. And, and Paul had revelation of it. And Paul walked in such a mighty dimension of the Christ life. Here's, here's what I'm trying to get across. There's absolutely nothing that you need or can attain that is not already within you. There is nothing, there is no answer to what you need that is outside of yourself. It's that tree of life. It's the Christ as us that feeds us. So our days are done seeking from a, a God out there somewhere or an anointing to come reside upon us. You no longer need to seek from the outside source. There is no outside source. It has been placed within you as a Christ believer. The anointed one has joined himself to you. This is so powerful. The anointed one has joined himself to you and you are one spirit with him. Now, we're, I hope as we, as we go on, we're going to explore what that means. We have not, we've not even come to contemplate what it means. The Bible says, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Let that sink in. One spirit with the Lord. No separation, no division. We're joined together in spirit, vine and branch. There should be a flow from the, from the vine to the branch. We're one spirit. There's a flow from him. There's a flow from the Christ within us. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Let's go back to the original garden, Adam and Eve in the garden. There was nothing Adam and need needed outside the garden. Now, I don't, I don't know. I know there's a lot of talk, metaphor, metaphorically speaking and symbolically and all that stuff. Literally, however, however you want to look at it, Adam and Eve did not have to go outside the garden to have any need met. Jesus did not have to go to any source to have any need met except being one with the Father. So Paul comes along and he says, My God shall supply all of your need, singular, not needs. Most people quote it, my God shall supply all of your needs. No, you don't have needs. You have one need, and that is to come and zero in, get focused, get tapped into the Christ that is within you. Now I'm going to ask you, I'm just going to ask three, four questions. Can I do that? What if everything that you need, you already have? What if everything that you'll ever need, God has already created in those six days of creation? Now, it might be in a dimension of the invisible, which is just a different frequency, different vibration, not visible to us. But what if it's already there? What if your days of asking and hoping and praying and begging and pleading and wondering are over for God to come from out there to do something for you? What, what if life now was an implementing and a discovering, an awakening of what you already have? It's a matter of perception, of consciousness. What if the Holy Spirit is leading us to all truth from the Christ as us so that we might live that life, the Christ as us life? What if all those, what if all those things are true? What, what if <clears throat> Jesus, what if, what if actually 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, that says, as he is, so are we in this world? One last what if. What if Jesus is actually living his life as you? No longer living for Jesus. Already been there. No longer Jesus just living through me. Been there. What if we're living one life together with him? His life is your life. 
your life is his life. As he is, so are we in this present world. There's one life. There's not two lives. This is what the whole thing. You died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So I want you, I want us to, and I'm, I'm making this journey with you, okay? These series of, of teachings that I'm coming into, and we're going to keep going. I'm coming into this realization myself that there's not two lives. There's just one life. There's never duality. All duality comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life is just one. One power, one life, one source. Jesus tapped it. Jesus lived out of that. What if, what if that were true? What if, the, what if the tree of life says to us that everything that you need, I've got right here, and that tree of life is planted right in the middle of your being, that Christ, that, that kingdom. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil says no way. Tree of life says, yes, there is a way. Here's, here's the realization I'm coming down to you guys. It all depends on what tree I'm eating from. I'm learning to set that tree of the knowledge of good and evil off to the side. What, what is it this morning? I've asked myself this week, and I'm going to ask you this morning, what is it that you think you have need of? Do you think you have need of, of deeper revelatory teaching? Do you think you have need of, of revelation within yourself? Do you think you need healing, deliverance? Think maybe, maybe the church always praying for a revival. Do you think... The church needs revival. How about freedom? Do you think you need a greater freedom in your life? Now, what we've done is this. We've looked outside of ourselves to deliver and to bring those things to us. We've looked outside ourselves. And generally, it's to other people. We've looked to a teacher. We've looked to a pastor or a prophet to give us a word, to connect us, to get us hooked up. We're... <laughs> Where, where, does the, where, where, does, where does the supreme teacher live? Where does the revelator live? Where does the healer, the deliverer, the reviver, where does the emancipator live? He lives in you. The Christ in you is the teacher. The Christ in you is, is the revealer. He's the healer, the deliverer, the reviver. The Christ in you is the emancipator. When you know the truth, the spirit of truth, when that Christ begins to lead you into truth, it's that truth that sets you free. You'll know the truth. Truth will make you free. It's not memorizing Bible. It's not, not, not that. Although it, I, I would say it can be at times if the, if the spirit breathes on it, gives it life. But the point is this. It all resides in you. It all resides in you. So it's... It's in you. It's not out, out there. I want to emphasize that. I know a lot of you here at the Digital Cathedral are no longer looking uh, outside yourself. You're learning to look within. Maybe some of you are newer here. And you're just you're learning. This might seem strange. might seem a little bit forward. As, but as long as we think we played any part in anything that God has done to reveal to us, to heal us, to deliver us, to set us free... As long as we think we have to do something, we're eating from the wrong tree. The, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is always the tree of, I must do something to become. Isn't that what Ad, Adam and Eve were, were tempted? You need to eat this so that you can become like God. The deceiver was saying, you must do, in reality, you must do to become what you already are. Because God said, I already made you in my image and likeness. I already breathed into you my very essence. The hiss of the servant is you, you, you can become. The Christ that dwells within you is saying you already are. It's a, it's a total awareness. This, this whole issue, getting to the right tree, it's, a, it's an awareness issue to have the mind of Christ. We cannot live the life of Christ till we have the mind. We're, we're, we're functioning out of the mind of Christ. And Paul said we have it. So now I'm learning to not trust my own inclinations, my own logic. The things that my five physical senses feed me, it says your body's, your body's sick, you're, you know, you're, you're this, you're that, you're the other thing. I'm, I'm learning, I, I, get, I give that no place. I'm learning to, to listen within and to just simply respond. 
The mind of Christ says, of my own self, I can do nothing. The mind of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil says, I can do most things. And the things I can't do, then I ask God to help me do. Wrong tree. I want to show you, I want to show you the way that the mind of Christ thinks. Hey guys, I just wanted to break in here for a real quick commercial to let you know that we have an opportunity to take this message of grace and inclusion into some areas that we've never, never been able to reach before. I have been offered the opportunity to have a program on the NOW Television Network. You probably haven't heard of the NOW Television Network. I hadn't until recently, but the NOW Television Network broadcasts on Roku, Apple, and Amazon Fire. That's stateside. Overseas, they have a number of cable outlets as well as satellites that reach into Western Europe, very heavily into Western Europe and into Africa. Um, I might also mention they have a mobile app, which I have that I watch the Now Television Network on. You can put it on your phone. Just go to the App Store. Now, if, we're, if we do this, which we're, go we're going to give it a swing, I've signed a contract. First program will be the last Sunday of October. It's a one-year contract until next October. Now, in doing this, I'm going to face some expenses that I haven't faced before for production, added production than what we do now, editing, and it's obviously going to take some more administrative costs for the people that respond and so on and so forth. So what I would like you to consider is to partnering with me for one year, just one year from October to October on some kind of monthly basis so that we can plan out the expenses and know how we can meet this obligation. I think it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. And I'm anxious to see. I've, I've so much wanted to reach into other parts of the world with this message. So hope you can help me. I look forward to hearing from you. And let's make this Now TV Network thing an absolute go for grace and inclusion. Thank you so much. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Here's, here's how the mind of Christ views. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. He says, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses. Now this, this is a, a revelation of the tree of life, because this is what the Father says. Now I'm going to read that verse again, and I want you to listen for anything that you did in this process. Prayer you prayed, faith you extended. What did you do to, to, to get this? See, this is a tree of life. Tree of life, you do nothing. You just respond. You say, thank you. I got it. I see it. Listen, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. He has forgiven all of your trespasses. I don't see you anywhere in that verse. I don't see your striving anywhere in there. I don't see your decision in there. I don't see your faith in there. I don't see your prayer in there or your confession. It's totally his work. That, that's, that's the tree of life. See, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil sees me involved. And that's, that's what we all cut our teeth on spiritually in the church was that we, we had to pray the prayer. We had to have the faith. We had to extend ourselves. We had to believe. We had to receive. It put us in the equation, and you're not in the equation. The whole mentality of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil is I can achieve. That nothing is really going to work. Salvation is going to work till I put my stamp of agreement and approval upon it by what I do. The mind of Christ says, again, my own self, I can do nothing. I could do nothing to make myself alive. I could do nothing to have all my trespasses forgiven. And that 13th verse of Colossians chapter 2 is a total work of the Father. And what, what is our part? Our part is to be aware of it. Our part is to be conscious of it. That's living the Christ life. And now what that means is this. When you, when you kick into this... <clears throat> That means now that he has total responsibility for your life. That you're giving him the right of way in everything you do. You give up control. You give up your opinions. You give up, you give up what you think is best. And he takes your life and he pulls it into his life 
so that as Jesus said, in that day you'll know that I'm in the Father and that you're in me and I'm in you. That's not two, that's one. There's no duality in the tree of life. The total focus for us is to get our our, our self honed in on what the Christ is within us, to raise our consciousness to our completeness in him. And when I meditate that, it seems like, you know, I, okay, I got completeness down to a level, but then when I really think about it and meditate about it, it goes to another level. And I want to come to the place like Jesus where he had one, one go-to place. Jesus had one go-to place, and it was the Father. His continual testimony was, the Father and I are one. His testimony was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're going to come to that place where the world will see us, they'll see the Father. But for that to take place, we have to keep shedding out everything that is of us, of our decisions, our choices, our rationale, our logic, and just listen to what he's absolutely saying to us. There's one supreme being, you guys. Romans chapter 11. This, this may help you right here to see what I'm driving at this morning. Romans chapter 11. And if, if, if I confuse you this morning or I'm going too deep too fast, just relax because we're going to go back and find fine tooth, fine comb tooth, fine tooth comb this. We're going to go back and back and back and back and back and forth till we all are arriving at where. I feel like the Father's taking us right now, which is a lot deeper understanding of the Christ as us life. Having the mind of Christ, the Christ that is within us, not being the navigator of everything that we do as it was for Jesus, as it was for Paul. All right, watch this. I think this might help you to see it just a little bit. One, one source, one, one person. It says, for of him... And through him and to him are all things. Do you see that? There's nothing outside. This is a circle for from him, through him, back to him are all things, including you. You came from him. We're learning to live him as us. And we're eventually returning back to that very source. So why, why have we been messed up? Why, why, what has been our problem? I'll tell you the problem is we have empowered things that have no power. By eating at the tree, I hope, hope I can get this down in your understanding. By eating at the wrong tree and assigning good and evil to things, you've empowered it. You thought this is really good. This is really bad. And you've given place to it. It's been our decision, our knowledge. That has ruled the day. And the knowledge that we operate from naturally comes from our five physical senses. What I feel, what I see, what I hear, what I smell, what I taste. See, that all feeds data to your brain. And that puts us over to tree of the knowledge of good and evil to make choices based on that data. Now we're learning to live from different data. We give no place to the five physical senses. That they can yell and holler. But now the data comes to us from the Christ that is within, Christ in me. That's what feeds me now the data, and I respond to it. So there are times that there's going to be a conflict between what your senses feed you and what the, the Christ within is saying. I had a very simple decision the other day, and I wanted to do a particular thing, but inside I knew, no, that's not the way. And I've learned enough now that I said, okay, I yield to that which is within rather than that which seemed the best, and as it worked out, what was within was actually exactly what I needed to do. So where the hole, the hole that we've dug that we, that we are trying to get out of, and we're doing it rapidly as, as sons and daughters that are manifesting, coming into to the life that Jesus lived, we've empowered things and then made them so strong in our minds made them so strong in our minds that we thought there was a war that we had to fight, that we had to try to get a greater power from someplace to come defeat this lesser power that had no power, but we had empowered. All these things that, that we gave power to that had no power, 
We call them spirits. We just, we scapegoated it off on a spirit. Can I show you what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm getting you down this morning to, to, to see we operate out of one mind, uh, one impulse, uh, one response, and it comes from the Christ that is within, that Paul said was in his life, was a mystery to the Gentiles, but it's now in them. And then he stretched it out to even the barbarians and the Scythians, the most unevangelized people in the world. And he even included the idol worshipers by saying, in him we live and move and have our being. So we're trying to get a life that that's focused totally on what we're doing. All right, where was I? Oh yeah, we've caught, so when we, we give power to things that have no power and they start getting strong in our life, we, we call them, we call them spirits. Let me, let me just show you real quick what I mean. Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 19. Let me read just verses 19 and, and uh, 20, down to 21. Now the works of the flesh which are evident are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. I'm just going to read them real quick because I just want it for impact. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you before had just as I told you in time past that those who practice such things cannot inherit the kingdom. Doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. The kingdom is not heaven. Matthew calls the kingdom of heaven because he's, he's relating it to, to Jewish people, but over in uh, Mark and Luke, they called the kingdom of God. It means that you're not going to enter into the life that I'm talking about this morning, the Christ is us life. You're not going to move into the tree of life. You're going to stay over there to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? you, don't, you don't inherit the kingdom. You don't live in inherit. Now, here's, here's my point. He said these are works of the flesh. How many meetings have I been in? How many people I've been around where they want to cast the spirit of fornication, adultery, the, the spirit of anger, calls it wrath, or selfishness, or those, those we come against that spirit of heresy, or envy, that, that, that spirit of envy is taken over, or drunkenness, we bind that spirit of alcohol. See, we, we've, we've called them spirit. They're not spirits. They're the results of eating at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And at some point, we've rationalized and energized and strengthened these things until they start running our life. And they all come because we don't know who we are. Then he goes on and says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, long-suffering. There's nine of those. And he says, watch, against, there is, against such there is no law, and those who are Christ." have crucified the flesh. How do, you, how do you kryptonite? How do you crucify the flesh? The fruit of the Spirit. When you're running in the fruit of the Spirit, brother, the tree of life produces the fruit of the Spirit. When that is produced in your life, it has totally negated, neutralized, kryptonited all those works of the flesh. You don't find anybody that walks in love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, the tree of life, that's over there hung up in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and has decided why he needs to drink himself into oblivion or why he's doing all kind of crazy stuff. That absolutely, absolutely takes care of it, the, the fruit of the Spirit. So where does, where does the focus come? The focus doesn't come in trying to fight and battle and come against and cast out the, the flesh. What we need to do is move off of that tree and come over and grow the fruit of the Spirit. And when you grow the fruit of the Spirit, automatically you don't have to fight anything. There's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. It will actually take care of everything itself. So we've empowered these things, have no power. And this is why it's been difficult for people to, to live the Christ as us life. First of all, there's been no teaching about it. There's been no teaching about the Christ in you being the controlling factor of your life as a manifesting son and daughter of God. We still have been eaten from that tree of logic and empowering things that are, we think are good or things that are evil. And it's eaten off the wrong tree and we've suffered the consequences for it. So Jesus comes along. Here's what Jesus did. At Calvary, Jesus reversed the great sin that Adam and Eve brought into humanity was not separation from God. It was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that was passed down from generation to generation to where as soon as you're born, you are, you are uh, 
taught by your culture, by your family, by the teachers at school, how to eat from that tree. We all did it. For, we all sinned. It means we all missed the mark. Missing the mark is eating from the wrong tree as far as I'm concerned. You don't miss the mark when you eat from the tree of life. So Jesus comes along and he reverses everything that Adam did. Whatever you think Adam did. There's opinions and ideas and theologies built around. I don't care what, what, where, where you're at. Whatever you think that Adam did to jack up humanity, Jesus came and reversed it. So that we can see there's only one power, one presence, one will and one mind. Jesus has cleared the deck of everything else. I'm teaching pretty good this morning if you're getting it. And if, if, if you're going, man, this is, I'm overloaded. Just hold on. We're going we're gonna to keep moving through this every week. I, I want, I'm, I'm bringing you the next step to where the Father's moving the body of Christ. And what I'm teaching you, you're going to find people starting to move into in the, in the weeks and the months and even the years that are ahead. One power. Jesus said something startling in Matthew chapter 28, and we have not believed it. And I'm staying in line with us empowering that which has no power, which has impeded us living the life that we were designed to live, which is out of the breath of God, out of the flow of God, out of the Christ that is within, learning how to, to function fully, to get everything we need out of the kingdom that is within, out of the Christ motivation that is within us. This is all good stuff, y'all. This is, there's, there's whole, we're moving so fast. Watch this. Here's what Jesus said about all this. Jesus obliterated. He said this. I'm just going to read one verse. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There's that word all. Now, you can study the word all in Greek all you want. It simply means all. What was Jesus telling the truth? What if that's true? What if Jesus has all authority? Then he turns around in the next verse and says, I'm sending you into the world. In, in effect, he's saying, I'm going to take this all authority that I have in heaven and in earth, and I'm going to impute it to you so that you can go and do what I have done. What if that's true? What if Jesus has all authority? The word is exousia, and it means the liberty of doing as one pleases. It means power. It means rule of government, jurisdiction. It means dominion. Jesus said, I have it all. How did he get it all? The Father gave it to him. The Father gave it to him. And now the Father, through the Son, is imparting it to you. What if Jesus wasn't pulling our leg? Let's just look at this. <clears throat> now, this, this is going to put some of you on tilt. Don't get mad at me. But if Jesus has all authority, what does that leave for any other entity to have authority-wise? Jurisdiction. Power. Government. Dominion. What does that leave any other entity if Jesus has it all? How many lesser authorities would there be if Jesus has 100% of it? How many would have 5%, 1%, 2%? Is there anything that would have any authority, exousia, if Jesus has it all? Now, I can assure you that he did. And, he, and, and in fact, he destroyed... He destroyed, I'm going to read a verse from Colossians. He destroyed anything that you think has been given power that had no power, but the mind of man eating at the wrong tree had empowered. He said in, he said in, in, in Colossians, what is, let me just flip back here and get my scripture. Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15. He says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus obliterated anything that you thought had any authority, power, dominion, or might. Jesus totally annihilated it. So why are we still battling and fighting that which has been defeated? The only reason is because we've, we've resurrected it. We've empowered it again. 
And there are churches all over the country that are fighting the devil this morning. They're coming against all kinds of stuff that Jesus has already annihilated. It's the result of eating at the wrong tree, deciding what is evil, and then focusing on that. Empower. The more you focus on it, the more you empower it. Jesus, Paul said, don't, don't focus on the adulteries, the heresies, the, the murders, the envy, the strife. He said, don't focus. He said, come in there with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, long suffering. And when you're focused on that, when, you, when that becomes where your emphasis is because you're eating from the tree of life, you're responding to the Christ that is within. These other things all of a sudden have, have no power. They have, they have no ability. What if he really did disarm all of that? All those, all those hours I spent in spiritual warfare, all those hours I spent coming against and, and shaking my fist and binding and loosing and all that stuff. What if there is no war except the war that goes on in your mind? Because we have empowered it. I'm helping you this morning. We're, mo we're making some transitions. We're coming into the, to the life of Christ. I'm not going to tell you that you are the Christ. I'm telling you, you're a chip off the old block. That what Jesus is, he has given to us so that we can function as he functions in this world. So what if it's just been a head game, a head trip? Could it be that 2 Corinthians, could it be that Paul had a, had a revelation on this? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons are, of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. So they're not coming from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're, they're not according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty to God. To pulling down. Watch. Now watch it. Where, watch where all of this is. Pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Where, where is something going to war against the knowledge of God? In your head? In your emotions? Right? Bringing every thought. There it is again. Imaginations, thoughts. Bring them into the obedience of the Christ that is within you. He just says to the obedience of Christ. I'm saying the Christ that is within you. You run, you run the things that run through your head through the filter of the Christ that is within you and respond according to what the Christ within you is saying to you. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So all that stuff that has uh, wreaked havoc in the minds of man, you eliminate it when you're obedient. When you start eating from the right place, from the, from the right tree. It's a head trip, y'all. We're not trying to get a victory on this stuff. The Christ that is in you is trying to get you to live from a place of victory, not try to get to a place of victory as we did for so many years. And there was always one more thing to do. One more battle to win. One more devil to cast out. Now that we're showing this morning and we're bringing revelation to the table that there's only one power, one mind, that Jesus has obliterated everything else, then I can tell you this morning, the war is over. There is no longer a war. Unless you empower that which has no power. Unless you eat at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you deem something evil and you focus on it and give it strength and give it place, give it focus in your life. The way you can annihilate it is to, is to rechange, change your focus, come over to the tree of life, start growing some love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, responding to the voice of the Father. See, I haven't fought spiritual warfare in a lot of years. This was one thing I got behind me pretty quick. And I noticed that the day that I stopped doing spiritual warfare, I was not cognizant of all that junk going on that I had seen before. And I've helped people come out of that mess. No binding, no casting down, no coming against, no loosing, no standing against, no breaking strongholds, no bringing down territorial spirits. They've all been annihilated and defeated. They do not have my focus. The one that lives in you, the Christ in you, has all authority. He's already disarmed every principality, disarmed every power, and has cleared the way for you to now live a life 
that he said you would live in being as he is in this present world. He lives as you. You live as him. There's one life. There's one spirit. You are joined to your one spirit joined to the Lord. And he's revealing to you on a progressive basis the kingdom, the garden that manifesting sons function in where all provision is already supplied. Now, I'm going I'm to close out. I've got maybe just three, four minutes. Real quick, I'm gonna, I, did, I just want to close out with this because I want you to see Jesus in action with this. So I'm going to do this real quick. So don't, don't click off yet because I want you to see how it looks when you eat either from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or from the, the tree of life. This, this is an instance that took place in life of Jesus. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. He, he was there alone. But the boat, he'd sent the guys on ahead. The boat was now in the midst of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. So that's the word. See, that's, that's what they should have responded to right there. That's the tree of life. That's the word that is coming from him to them. And Peter answered and said, He got it. He said, Okay, if it's you, he said, I'm going to come to you. Jesus said, Come on. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, which was boisterous, he's over to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now, deciding that that wind is boisterous. It's strong. It's going to take him down. He began to sink and he cried out, Lord, say, saying, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand, caught him and said to him, oh, you have little faith. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Now, you see two guys working there. You see Jesus eating from the tree of life. You see Peter eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now let me ask you something. How much power and authority does Jesus have? All. How much power did the wind and the waves and the water have? Zero. The only power they had was that which was was empowered by the disciples and they were afraid. They'd start seeing all this boisterous wind and things going on and man, they didn't, they didn't think they were going to make it. What was it that caused Peter to sink? When he stopped eating at the tree of life, which was the word that Jesus spoke to him, come on, and he started eating over here at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he became fearful. Now what I'm talking about this morning is living the life of Christ today. Living a life from the unseen and then bringing that unseen realm into the seen. Because in the unseen, that's where your total supply is. Everything's been created. And Jesus knew how to draw from one realm to the other. How do we do that? I want to know. And we're going to get into this in the weeks that are ahead. All right, I think my time's up. I'm 51 minutes in. I try to go about 40, 45 minutes, but I just get wound up and start preaching. All right, hope you got something from this. We're going to build on this for a while. We're going to look at this multi dimension like a, I, I compare it to a diamond. When you look at the Christ in us, there's just a whole lot that it reveals and shows. So we're going to look at some mighty dimensions that I hope will bring us a little closer to fulfilling the totality of the plan and bring us into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. If that wasn't possible, then that job would have never been assigned. But that's, that's our destiny, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I'm going to tell you something. We're going to keep deep diving into this, and we're going to see some good things as we go. I'm learning with you. I'm happy to make the journey with you. I'm privileged. Thank you for being with me today. Let's keep at it. See you Wednesday night at The Secret Place. God bless. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. 
We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.